During that interview and in my introduction to it, there were a number of references to the area of philosophy known as metaphysics. Davison talked about the nature of reality. Throughout our discussion, the relationship between truth, goodness, and beauty was a constant presence. John Milbank's essay referred to modern philosophical assumptions that denied the ontological reality of reason. Each of these subjects involve questions or assumptions about the real nature of things. Metaphysics is concerned with what is real and how our experience relates to what is real. Well-behaved citizens of liberal democracies typically assume that we can safely ignore questions of what is ultimately real. Liberal democracies operate with the assumption that such things are unknowable or of no consequence for political life or just not worth getting worked up about. But the assumption that we can do without concern for metaphysics is a metaphysical assumption itself. It assumes that all human beings are really, in reality, creatures who can order public life well without reference to questions about what is ultimately real. It assumes something about the nature of human nature and about the nature of political order. The claim that the nature of the ultimately real is politically insignificant is not a neutral claim. Christian theology has historically been faced with countless questions that have a metaphysical dimension. How does an infinite creator interact with a finite creation? What's the meaning of the image of God in human beings and the consequences of that image for the unborn? What's the relationship between mind and body and of mind and body to spirit? How are the dual natures of Christ interrelated? And how can God be three in one? What's the meaning of I am as a defining name for God and of Logos as a defining name for Christ? What are the ramifications of the Apostle Paul's affirmation that in God we live and move and have our being and that in Christ all things hold together? How does the nature of the church as the body of Christ direct our lives as believers? And how might we properly tend and keep sexual relations, given what the Apostle calls a profound mystery at the heart of marriage? These are just a few matters, many with pressing practical considerations, that involve metaphysical questions. But we live in a culture that regards metaphysics as an exotic academic pursuit, and many of us attend churches that implicitly regard questions about the nature of things as a distraction from the real work of discipleship. Many Christians thus absorb from the culture around them fashionable assumptions about the nature of things, though they might occasionally try to insert concerns about select moral matters into those assumptions. There has in recent years been something of a revival in Christian metaphysics, inspired in part, it would seem, by the obvious cultural dead end of modernity and the subsequent retrieval of Christian theologians and philosophers, including many political philosophers, of many pre-modern claims and arguments about the nature of things. A new book by philosopher Adrian Pabst is part of this revival. It's notably part of a series of scholarly books defiantly called Interventions, books intended by the editors of the series and by the authors to question the accepted terms of discussion that dominate various disciplines and thus reinforce the nihilism of our age. The book Adrian Pabst has written is entitled Metaphysics, the Creation of Hierarchy. He begins his book by saying that it, quote, seeks to retrieve metaphysics and reveal its theological nature, close quote. In that short statement of purpose, Pabst embeds his argument that individual things are what they are, that they have the nature that they have because of their relationship to the triune God who sustains them in relationship to all other individual things. It may be a criminally irresponsible oversimplification, but for present purposes I hope it's adequate. For those of you whose eyes glazed over as soon as I said the word metaphysics, rest assured this is hard for me too, but I think it's worth some effort. It's worth the effort because most, if not all, of our peculiarly modern disorders are tied to metaphysical confusion one way or another. I recently talked with Adrian Pabst about his book, and we began by discussing why metaphysics is in such bad repute. Since the 19th century, metaphysics has had a very bad name. 
arguably uh, beginning with um, the sort of positivist revolution inaugurated by by Auguste Comte in in France, um, but also, of course, um, extending to thinkers as varied as Nietzsche, uh, and then in the twentieth century, uh, Heidegger, uh, a lot of French thinkers like Derrida, Deleuze, uh, more recently Marion. Uh, there is now a very long established tradition of um, philosophy that in some ways suggests that metaphysics has passed or ought to have passed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I very much take issue with in, in the book. O ought to have passed uh, because of some kind of natural evolution that we've outgrown it in some way? The thought has outgrown it? Um, yes, both uh, thought and experience. Mm -hmm. um, so the claim somehow is that Metaphysics locks us into some kind of straitjacket, some kind of iron cage of uh, Platonist uh, dualism or some form of modern monism, perhaps a la Hegel, in that we very much need to rid ourselves from these uh, constricting shackles. And it seems to me that a lot of this rests on a f profound misreading of the long uh, philosophical metaphysical tradition in the West and indeed beyond. Because, for instance, uh, Platonism is very often associated with some form of irreducible dualism between, on the one hand, the world of ideas, and on the other hand, the world of things. But, of course, Plato never said any such thing uh, at all. On the contrary, he always insisted that ideas um, are instantiated in things, and that we, as finite beings with finite minds, can only know ideas through things. So we have no direct cognition or vision of, of ideas themselves. All we have is, in some sense, the participation of things and ideas. Mm -hmm. That's what we can know. And, of course, the metaphysics of participation is very much what Plato uh, developed and, and bequeathed to us. And I think it's a core part of the Christian tradition. I'm, I'm sure we'll get on to that um, yeah. a, a little later. Yeah, in, I think, the first chapter of the book, you write, uh, Plato does not advocate a turn away from sensible ephemeral particulars in the perceptible world of things towards transcendent timeless forms in the invisible world of ideas. And yet that's the, uh, that's the conventional picture of Plato, that he does advocate this dualism and that we can, uh, mm. we can move on from these particular things to the transcendence quite safely, mm. which is why I think many of us tend to equate Plato with Gnosticism. That, uh, uh, and, and yet... Uh, you you insist this is not true to what Plato is, what his project is about. Absolutely, and I think it's not true for various reasons. First of all, when we look at more closely at how Plato thinks we can know any ideas, I think one popular misconception is to say, oh yes, it's the disembodied soul prior to its embodiment that has already seen everything, known everything, and then we kind of try desperately to remember, to recall, um, this knowledge of ideas that the soul had prior to its um, instantiation in the body. Mm -hmm. But of course, once again, Plato never said anything like that. The disembodied soul is very much a metaphor. And as we all know, metaphors are not to be interpreted literally. Indeed, none of Plato's metaphors, analogies, myths, or any other uh, figures of speech uh, should ever be interpreted literally. In fact, nothing should ever be interpreted literally, zero, period. Mm -hmm. um, and we know this also from the biblical tradition. So I think it's very dangerous to have a literalist reading. Secondly, when Plato talks about recollection, uh, the Greek word, of course, is anamnesis. And anamnesis doesn't mean remembering something which we once knew but have since forgotten. Anamnesis, in most of Plato's texts, uh, the middle but also the later dialogues, actually means something like uh, being awakened to, being alerted to. So when we see uh, beauty, what we're being alerted to is the idea of beauty. So when we see something beautiful, we, we are in some sense awakened to this idea of beauty, same with the good, same with justice and so on. And, and thirdly, I think, um, the, the key point in Plato is to say that um, we never completely transcend the material uh, embodied world. Even when we have knowledge of the good, it's in some way still um, with reference to the physical world. So let me give you another example. The famous myth of the cave, you know, about which you know, more, more books have been written, perhaps entire libraries have been written by now. 
I think the key argument in, in that myth of the cave is that when man frees himself from the false ideas to do with shadows in the cave and finally escapes and leaves behind a state of ignorance and comes to some kind of knowledge, he discovers that the author of all things is the sun. Now, the sun, of course, is something which even if we can never fully uh, glimpse it or perceive it because we simply cannot be equal to its, to its brightness, is still something which is also material. It's not just immaterial light. It's also something which still has in some ways a material form or appearance. So even when we discover the author of all things, we don't have a, an abstract cognition that is independent of the world. I think it's very much part of our universe. And in our finite mortal condition, that is in some sense all that's available to us. So the idea that somehow once we've had cognition, we can sort of leave behind the material world because it's really corrupt, uh, degenerate, uh, is holding us back, I just don't think corresponds to a, a proper reading of Plato. Uh, maybe you could explain a little bit the, the, the idea of the, the metaphysics of participation and how in the first chapter you talk about the 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 dilemma that was present in in pre-Socratic philosophy of the the problem what, what we know today is the problem of the one and the many of how universals and particulars can be related and and various uh, attempts to solve this problem um, is is this idea of participation uh, a, a way of solving it and and what does Plato have in mind and and then if you could also, how, how does this fit with with a Christian understanding of, of, uh, of God as creator? Mm. Yes, I think participation is a key concept or, or, or theory or paradigm to try and understand how it is that universals and particulars in some mysterious way relate to, to, to one another. Um, another way of saying this is to say that our experience of the world is very much one of unity and multiplicity at the same time. So we all have at different moments in our lives, I think, a sort of in inchoate sense that there is indeed one reality out there that we all inhabit, but that that reality also is a multiplicity of perspectives and therefore cannot be reduced to just a single vantage point but it doesn't can... but it doesn't seem entirely chaotic given that multiplicity exactly and i think it's to try and understand this idea that there is some fundamental order some fundamental order or direction of things that there's some sort of telos towards which we all in different ways um are oriented so uh, plato would say it's a it's a natural desire for the supernatural good uh, or, or you know i'm, I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. but that's sort of what what he would say now what I'm trying to argue in the book is that uh, participation is indeed key to making sense because it explains in some ways how particulars can partake of universal, so how something can be said to be beautiful because in some ways it participates in the idea of beauty. But the other key argument I'm trying to make is that we can't really understand how it is that particulars partake of universals unless we understand that universals are always already relational. And I think this is quite a, an important part of the, the Platonist framework that perhaps hasn't always been sufficiently accentuated. That is to say, for Plato, it's not just the case that somehow material things in some mysterious way participate in, in immaterial ideas. It's that the ideas themselves are relational. That is to say, they give themselves ecstatically. They, in some ways, if you like, are transcendent, truly speaking, and uh, unlike Aristotle's prime mover, the good is, as Plato says in the Republic, the author of all things. It's a creative principle. So the good, in some sense, likes to share uh, its goodness with other things. So the good endows all other forms with goodness and indeed endows all things with goodness. So everything has a share of the good because that's how the good is. So relationality and participation are very much, if you like, two sides of the same coin. Hmm. And this coin is a, a creative principle. And I think only the biblical tradition, only Judaism and Christianity can fully make sense of why the good would be creative. Because, uh, of course, the big problem in Plato is that the good is in some sense impersonal, anonymous, and also matter just pre-exists. Mm -hmm. And neither really captures the nature of the universe. So the, the biblical legacy is absolutely central in explaining how it is that all things come from God and tend towards God. So the good or the beautiful are, are not stark 
and uh, infertile realities that are simply abstracted. But again, you there's a, you use the term ecstasy. There's a, there's an ecstatic mm. expression and a, and a uh, a promulgation in some way. Uh, yeah, that, that 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 is, and and the the Christian account gives us a is is it the personality of God that that gives us uh, resources that Plato didn't have? Yes, I think it's the personal nature of the creative principle that's so um, so crucial and really changes everything, and also the idea that the personal creative principle creates everything out of nothing, including matter. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, Plato was unable to explain why there would be anything like matter, why matter would be in some ways predisposed towards receiving form, and so on and so forth. And here, I think it has to be said, Aristotle really made a breakthrough when he spoke of act and potency. And he spoke of matter in terms of potency and form in terms of act and the interaction between the two I think explains much better how things are the way they are. So I think Plato, if I can be in some ways simplistic, uh, I think Plato's very good on, in some ways, why things are. Aristotle is very good on how things are, but ultimately neither really explains it fully. And you need a, a biblically grounded Christian account uh, to really make sense fully of how and why things are the way they are. Mm. And, and the focus of the book, of course, is on individuation, so how and why things are all in some ways unique and individual. But my point is that they are so because they are relational. And and I think it's that relationality which I find more in Plato than I find it in Aristotle. So individual things can't be understood individualistically, as it were. Exactly. Uh, because I think so much of modern thinking to in some ways make a, a huge leap in time from from uh, antiquity to to the modern age so much of modern thinking focuses on individual substance individual essence or some variant thereof and and i think it always comes up against a very fundamental and simple question which is well why why would things be individual in the first place mm -hmm. what makes them individual because much of modern thinking explains in great detail how individual things generate other individual things. And that's, of course, very, very important. But there's little in critical engagement with why they're individual in the first place. Mm -hmm. And most modern thinkers just posit it as some kind of given. And I just don't think that that adds up. And that's, I think, where we need a metaphysics of relationality and participation. But that can only be a theological one because no anonymous uh, creative principle could explain in the end, why it would want to issue forth into a multiplicity of individual things. It, it doesn't even explain why the creative principle itself is, is individual. Mm -hmm. And I think a personal God who is both one and, and three, I think, captures that paradox, I think, not just better than, than Plato and Aristotle, but just captures that paradox. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think that the Christian tradition is so central to, to, all, uh, to all philosophy. At the beginning of this segment, I said that modern politics typically excludes discussion about the nature of things from political debate. But political debate about good policies must be grounded in some idea about how to define the common good. And behind visions of the common good, there are usually unstated assumptions about the good. Perhaps one of the reasons our political conversations are so rancorous and so deadlocked is that we falsely assume that we can talk about things like creating wealth or promoting justice or redefining marriage without any discussion about what these things really are. Our deepest disagreements are finally metaphysical, which is to say that they're finally theological. But we're not allowed to bring such fundamental questions into public debate even though metaphysical and theological assumptions are regularly smuggled into our policies. As a lecturer in politics at the University of Kent, Adrian Pabst is profoundly concerned with the practical consequences of metaphysical assumptions and believes that the practical problems we face will not be ameliorated without a more adequate and truthful framework of understanding. Take economics, for example. The Italian economist Stefano Zamani, who has written a lot on civil economy and, and has shaped the, the most recent uh, social encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, um, has said 
very um, correctly, I think, in a in a recent uh, chapter, that the, the common good is not just the aggregate good. It's not just the sum total of all individual goods. The common good is, in some sense, an objective reality that we are all part of to varying degrees. And so that when one person isn't flourishing, in some sense, no one is. Now, once again, people might be uh, saying, well, isn't that a little bit naive or utopian? You know, how, how can you possibly achieve a sort of mutual flourishing across the board? But the point is here not to say that we are talking about equal outcomes. What this idea of common good in a very strong substantive way is all about is to say it's not about majorities versus minorities. It's not the utilitarian calculus, you know, the greater happiness of the greater number. It has to involve uh, something that doesn't violate anyone's dignity. So if anyone's dignity is violated, and one cannot, one cannot possibly speak of a just society, of a just uh, politics, or indeed a just economy. And in that sense, we are really all part of this common good. So it may sound very abstract, but in the end, it's actually quite concrete. It's about the dignity of the person. It's about human flourishing. And these are not the same things as utility or happiness. In the second chapter of the book, you, you make reference to uh, Benedict XVI's famous uh, Regensburg Address, which mo many people don't know that the title was actually Three Stages in the Program of Dehellenization, which is somewhat cumbersome. But you, you suggest that he, uh, he provides a kind of vision of what you call an unrealized potential for an alternative modernity. And I won't read the rest of the sentence, but I assume you mean by alternative modernity that that modernity did emphasize the dignity of the individual, as you've just been talking about, that, that modernity did want to uh, affirm the reality of, uh, of the good in the individual, but it, but it went about it. Uh, the, the, the need we have for an alternative modernity is because modernity, as we actually have lived through it, uh, affirmed that dignity in, in, a, in a faulty way. Yes. Um I think I think what you've just said is possibly the most charitable interpretation of, of modernity, <laughs> if I may say so. Yes, and, and well. perhaps that's good because we don't want to dismiss all of its, you know, all of its achievements and all all the progress that has indeed. I, I've, um, I've never been so charitable toward modernity. So <laughs> <laughs> believe me. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, it's curious that that my book has has generated this. But anyway, um, no, I think I, it was I, the I Holy suppose... Spirit that, that generated. Oh yes, but, okay. well, and, and indeed, we, 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 we must be we must be generous, especially in um, in adversary. Um, but but I, th I think the, the the point is indeed that um, modernity puts the emphasis on the individual, but not so much on the person. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, 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 an argument one can easily demonstrate. I think modernity puts the emphasis in the end more on individual happiness rather than some notion of the common good. And I think crucially, modernity somehow suggests that there is a almost like a linear monolithic path towards progress and uh, towards um, sort of self-fulfillment. Whereas I think the alternative modernity that Pope Benedict um, speaks to, I think, is a modernity that champions the dignity of the person, the common good, and does not view socioeconomic progress as somehow the only means of delivering human flourishing. On the contrary, uh, I think what secular modernity does, and I think secular modernity is the dominant strand of modernity, is indeed to uh, neglect the costs of progress. And in some ways, the book uh, suggests that Christian thinking isn't anti-modern or amodern. It's indeed perhaps even more modern than a lot of modern thinking because it actually follows through a lot of these um, intuitions. But it does so along different lines, mm -hmm. you know, lines that are more relational, more reciprocal. And, and I do think that that is a, an alternative modernity that, that doesn't fall into the trap of either individualism or collectivism. Adrian Pabst. Lecturer in Politics at the University of Kent, a fellow of the Center of Theology and Philosophy, and the author of Metaphysics, the Creation of Hierarchy.